Now last week we we taught on the the bronze altar where they made the animal sacrifices. And this week the next thing in the tabernacle first was the bronze altar as soon as you entered into the, the, the wide gate the, the bronze altar was right there then next between the bronze altar and between the tent where the holy place is and where the holies of holies is in between there there was a bronze laver this was a large basin that had water in it and the priests they would wash their hands and their feet in it to cleanse themselves to be ritually clean to, to purify themselves before they did their priestly services Exodus 38 8 and he made the lever of brass and the foot of it of brass of the looking glasses of the women assembling which assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation now that was this was mirror, mirrors were donated by women by women who served at the gate of the tabernacle they couldn't come into the tabernacle because that was just for the priests but like always women were always there to help who was the first one to go to the stone and saw that the stone was rolled away it was women women even today sadly to say but I see more spiritual women than, I, than what I see guys so even today this is still going on Bible says they're the weaker vessel but it's not talking about being in the spirit they're not very weak when it comes to the spirit they love the Lord and, and men we do also but we're not as hoping as, as and emotional as women are you know women are very emotional and you can really see it in them also in Exodus 30 18 it says thou shalt also make a labor of brass and his foot also of brass to wash with all and thou shalt put it between the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar and thou shalt put water therein Hebrew word for water means living water this is how they got purified and what was living water in the New Testament Jesus Jesus, Jesus was called living water he said that to the to the woman the Samaritan woman who came to get water he said I could have given you living water and Jesus is that living water so even though this is a basin and it's speaking about the water but it's a symbolic of Jesus being the living water this was also a reminder to the people that we need cleansing before we approach the Lord we need to be cleansed that's why every time we pray if we have sin we need to ask for forgiveness of that sin before we start praying to the Lord and asking him for whatever we need to cleanse ourselves, and this is what they do. That's part of what, what they were doing by cleansing themselves with that water, purifying themselves, making themselves clean before the Lord before they started doing His services. If they were not clean, it says in Exodus 30, 21, So they shall wash their hands and their feet, that they die not. We're going to see that the priestly duties were a little more stricter than everybody else. And then we're going to see even further down that if we are a preacher or a teacher today, same thing goes with us. But I'll get to that later. But these priests, they had to be clean. They had to be purified by the washing of that water. That's living water. Remember, in the Hebrew language, that's living water. So they got purified by washing themselves with the water. And we're going to go a lot more into that. But if they weren't clean, it says here that they, not, that they die not. Titus 3.5 not by works of righteousness, righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. So plainly, it says it plainly right here, not by works of being good that we've done. People who've, who have, they've lived their life being good. Right here it says, it's not, it's not by that. That's not the way you get to God. It says, but according to his mercy, he saved us. According to his mercy. His mercy. Nothing we did. Nothing we did that we deserved it. It says right here, but according to His mercy, He saved us. He saved us. Did it say that the works that we did by being good is what saved us? No, what saved us is accepting God's mercy. 
and it says by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost by the washing of regeneration regeneration means I give you an example you have a dead battery you charge it up again and it's good to use right it's dead now it's good well that's what generation is is the Lord regenerates us because remember we were dead we're dead before we accept Jesus Christ it says it all through the Bible that we're dead but he's our regeneration he makes us alive again now can we die again when Jesus gives us life we have life Amen. right here it says by his mercy he saved us the word saved does that does that mean he's doing it or he's done it he's done it God the Lord says according to his mercy he has saved us so when you accept him and you let this regeneration of life come on you he makes you alive and then he fills you with the Holy Ghost and I'll talk more about that in a minute but you're alive once you're alive you don't die again mm -hmm. not God's way now a real battery yeah but spiritually when we're dead and God puts life in us we do not die again and it plainly shows it right here by according to his mercy he saved us it doesn't say he's saving us that we might die again so he's saving us but no he says he saved us it means we're not gonna die again amen? amen that's some good news then he says by the renewing of the Holy Spirit that's how we live by the renewing of the Holy Spirit because we fall we do sin and when we sin what do we do we ask for forgiveness and that's when the Holy Spirit when you're in sin can the Holy Spirit work through you no because you're in sin so when we when we fall when we sin that's why we said that's why I say don't wait till the end of the day when you go to bed at night and say father forgive me of my sins that's not really asking for forgiveness that's not really asking that you want to repent from the sin you've committed because it's just oh I, it's a ritual thing then when you go to bed at night you just say, say the same thing no when we sin we should right then and there ask the Lord to forgive us so we can stay in the spirit walking with them we cannot walk with the Lord when we're in sin we're in unforgiven sin hope you understand what I'm saying there mm -hmm. so forgiveness it's a it's, it's this is our way of life if it's, it's it's just it's just a continual way we we live now like I said before sin is not that we that we need to sin every day seriously y'all listen to me when you're walking in the spirit the closer you get to the Lord the less you're going to sin when you're a young Christian yeah you're gonna sin 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 but as you get closer to the Lord that sin becomes less and less you're never going to get to the point where you're not going to have any more sin not until that day we go to be with the Lord but that sin can get less and less in your life because what happens when you get closer the Lord said in James the best way to fight sin the devil is by getting closer to him so if we get closer to him does that mean we're going to sin the same or sin less yes. it means we're going to sin less we confess our sins to him He'll forgive us. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, it says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. To cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Meaning, He cleanses us from all sin. Because if it's not righteous, it's sin, right? And that's what He says. Just like the priest in the tabernacle who had to wash every day, same with us. Every time we sin, we ask for forgiveness, and He cleanses us. It's not we don't lose our salvation. It's been only it's been done once. Like I said, when you give your life to the Lord, when He died on the cross, that was one time. Because you sin again, that doesn't mean you go back to the cross again. Because you've already got life. You don't need to go back to the to the cross. The cross gave us life forever. So we don't need to go back to the cross. We need to go in the Holy Spirit and ask for forgiveness. There's a difference there. Some people don't know the difference between those two. And just like the priest, it says, unless they were cleansed, unless they were purified, the Lord couldn't use them. The same thing with us. How can the Lord use us in His ministry that He's given us? And what ministry do we all have? Witnessing. The ministry of reconciliation. 
telling people about the Lord. That, that's one thing all Christians have. They all have, we all have that ministry. Now, if we're not cleansed, can, we, can God use us in this ministry? No. no. That's why it's so important that when we do sin, we ask for forgiveness right then and there so the Lord can start using us. Because if you sin in the morning and you wait until nighttime to ask for forgiveness, was He able to use you that day? No. no. When you sin, when we sin, you need to ask for forgiveness right then and there. Because I want to be used by the Lord. I mean, I do. And I hope it's in y'all's heart also. God, use me. That's why I've given you my heart, because I want you to use me. I want to live for you. That should be in all born-again Christians' heart. Use me, Father. And you know, if you know, well, until I ask for forgiveness of this sin, He can't use you. And if that doesn't bother you, then you better check your heart out. Where's your heart? The Lord has given us, given us the remission of sin. And He renews us with the Holy Spirit. But if we want fellowship with God, this is what we need to do. Now you've got remission, you're born again, that stays. As you, as you sin, and we will, then you ask for forgiveness. And when you're not asking for forgiveness, you're not in fellowship with the Lord. When you're in sin, you're not in fellowship with the Lord. But in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26, that He might sanctify and cleanse it, Speaking about, he's talking about the church here from the verse above. That they might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Which I've said several times before. How do we get cleansed? Through the word. So the way we get washed is by the word. If we're not into the word and studying it, how can you be washed? How do you know you're even dirty? If, you don't, if you're not studying the Word of God, if you're not in the Word of God, how can, he, how can He wash you? Now, if you're going by what a preacher or a teacher might tell you, well, then are you in the Word or are you just putting your trust in a man? Think about it. Are you in the Word or are you putting a, your trust, your confidence in a man? Many, many Christians are that way. They don't get into the Word. They expect the preacher or the teacher to do all the studying. And then they'll just go on what he says. I would not put my trust, I would not put my confidence in any man. If I can see he's walking in the Spirit, and he's not taking the Scriptures out of context, then I'll listen to him. But remember, there's many wolves out there. And if you're not in the Word, how are you going to know that's a wolf? If you're not in the Word yourself, how are you going to know... That this is a wolf if you don't know what the Bible says. If you're not washed, Jesus says in John 13, 8, Peter said unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. This is at the Lord's Supper. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. So if you don't allow the Lord to wash you, what's he say? You have no part with me. I mean, not, not, not these, not Peter, except Judas, but the rest of them, Peter and the rest of them, they were born again Christians. They were followers of the Lord. But right here he says, when you have, he says, you don't have no part with me. He's saying, you're not, you don't, you're not in fellowship with me. You know, there's a lot of Christians out there who are born again, but they have no fellowship with the Lord. And this is what Jesus is saying to, to Peter. He said, if, I, if, I, if you don't let me wash you, how do you have fellowship with me? Remember the labor was made of brass mirrors. Mirrors. God shows us through, his, through these mirrors our sins. He shows us our sins through these mirrors. And these mirrors are the Word. They're the Word. So how are we going to know what sins in our life if we're not looking in the mirror? And the mirror, like I said, is the Word of God. Because He'll show you what your sins are. He'll show you where you need to be washed. He'll show you the dirt on your face. I mean, if you don't look in the mirror, are you going to see dirt in your face? That you're dirty? No, no you're not. Like I said, you need to read the Word of God so, you can, so the Lord can show you, hey, this is you. Clean it. How do you clean it? And He always tells us what we need to do. So the mirror, you have to look into the, the, the basin. The cleansing is very, very important to our life with the Lord. Very important. If, you do not, if we do not have fellowship with the Lord... 
And the way we have fellowship with the Lord is by getting close to Him. And the way we get close to Him is by studying His Word. If we do not have that fellowship with Him, are we going to be strong Christians? No, we're not. The thing that gets me about Christians, born-again Christians, like I've said many times before, we have the power of God living in us, right? I mean, who's more powerful than God? It sure ain't the devil. So what most Christians are doing, this is the way they're living. And I give you an example here. They're going into battle with, with sticks. Satan has a machine gun. Now, are we going to do anything with our stick against a machine gun? I don't think so. Now, the way we should go into battle is still going in with a stick. But well, the way we should go into battle with God's armor. And His armor is a tank. Now you got a tank. And a tank against a machine gun. Big difference, right? Oh, yeah. Are the bullets going to penetrate that tank? No, they're not. God's not going to, I mean, the devil is not going to penetrate the word. So we can go into battle with a stick, or we can go into battle with a tank, our Lord. But most Christians, like I said, they're living, they're living to feed lives because they have a stick. They're not using the power of God. Acts 1.8 says that He gives us power of the Holy Spirit. It comes to live in us. I choose to use the power of the Holy Spirit instead of going into battle with a stick. And when I say stick, I mean, I don't know what I'm doing. I've heard this, and I'm just repeating what I've heard, but that's, that's no power in there. Power doesn't come from what you hear from other people. That's not power. Power comes when you use the Holy Spirit that is in you, and you're using that power. Now you got power. And in John 15, 3, it says, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. And the word is what? Jesus. The word is Jesus. But how does Jesus speak to us? With his word. The Bible. So we need the scriptures. We need God's word. And God's word is through the Bible. And that's the way he cleanses us. That's, that's why when we look into the mirror, we can see that we're dirty and we need to be cleansed. Amen? Now, many of us don't care what we see in the mirror. Hebrews 5, verses 11 through 14. Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. For when, for the time we ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk, and not of strong meat. This is a lot of Christians. The Lord is saying you should be on meat. But you're still on milk. That's what I'm saying. These Christians. They have faith, dirt on their face. But then they're not washing it. They like it the way they are. You know you get a baby. That messes on himself. Or her. You think they care? They can play all day long with poop in the diaper. It don't bother them. But this is what we're talking about. Y'all hear me? I'll, I'll bring it to reality. Christians don't care about the dirt on their face. They ought, God says right here, you ought to be teachers. But instead, you're still on milk. That's not pleasing to our Lord. That might be pleasing for some Christians. They don't care. And again, I'll have to ask, are you sure? Are you sure you're a Christian? If that doesn't bother you, that you're not pleasing God, are you sure you're a Christian? I would have to ask that, right? I'd have to. Because true born again Christians want to please God. They want to. They want to be cleansed. Now all this is about the lever in the uh, tabernacle. That's how important it is for those priests to be cleansed through that water. I'm just giving a, today's example of how important it is that we be clean. Now he's speaking to us Christians because you're not going to tell a lost person you ought to be a teacher. So he's speaking to us right here. He's speaking to us. Hey, you should be teachers by now. You should, you should be off the milk. The Christians he's speaking to are the ones who are not listening to the words of God. Even if they're listening to a preacher or a teacher, 
You know how many people sit in church and don't hear a word? I'm in a church right now where the pastor preaches in the Spirit. I know he does because my Spirit relieves it. He's preaching in the Spirit. But do I hear anything in the church? Like, amen, anything to show that they're listening? It's just silence in there. Just silence. I mean, if you're really listening to the words, to what God has to say, there's going to be excitement there. It, it is with me. And when God says things to me, I'm like, amen, you know, I got to. The Holy Spirit in me is listening and we together, we get excited. But you have a lot of people out there, you don't hear a word. Listen to me. If you're not growing, going forward as a Christian, if you're not going forward, then, then guess what that makes us? It makes us backsliders. If you're not going forward, then you're going back. Just like the Lord says, hey, you either form your or against me. You're not gonna, there's no middle line with the Lord. There's no right in the fence, like the Revelation says. There's no right, there's not no neutral where you can be just in the middle. So if you're not going forward in the Word of God, then you're going backward. And if you're going backward, that's called backslider. You're becoming a backslider. And in verse 13, for everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Do you know that God wants sons? He don't want babies. God wants sons. He says if you're a babe, you're unskillful. And if you're unskillful, if you're not washed, can he use you? No. Again, it's just shown right here. I can't use you. Just like I said before, you take my grandson, three years old. He's cute. Everything he does is cute. But let him come back 15, 20 years from now. Let him come back and let him act exactly the same way. Is that cute anymore? No. No, to me, I would think that would be pretty pathetic. Well, do you know how many Christians we have that way? They get born again. They're on milk. But that's it. They live their next 20 years or so, and they're still the same. Now, that's not cute anymore. And that's not pleasing to the Lord. These verses right here, God wants mature Christians that He can use. Verse 14, But strong meat belongs to them that are full of age, even those who by reason of use of their senses exercise to discern both good and evil. Like I said, He wants sons. He wants Christians that are mature so He can use them. That's what He's saying. He wants to use them. They know right from wrong. They know what's spiritual and what's not spiritual. Because they read the Word of God. Now, moral people, they look at things as being good. Or to, in God's eyes, it's sin. There's a lot of things like that in, or according to the world, in the flesh, that the worldly people think, oh, that's okay, there's nothing wrong with that. But in God's eyes, it is. So, He wants us to be mature in the Word so He can use us, so we can tell people what's right and what's wrong, what's sin, what's not sin. In Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 through 12. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying away the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Paul saying it's time to leave the basics of what Jesus did for us, how we got born again, how to repent of our sins. That's basic, basic stuff. It's the Lord saying it's time to leave that. It's time to grow up. Put our faith in the Lord. Put our faith in the Word of God. Grow in the Word of God. It's time to become mature Christians in the Word. Now how many of us want to stay babies? I don't think, well, I know us right here. From knowing y'all, I don't think y'all want to stay babies. I think y'all want to grow and be mature Christians. I think y'all want to be out there on the, on the battlegrounds. I think y'all want to go out there in a tank, not with sticks. What am I teaching right now? I'm teaching how to have fellowship with the Lord. Verse 2, of the doctrine of baptism and of laying on of hands and of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. Paul's saying that being baptized, most of us know why, why we get baptized, I think. I think most Christians know why well, I'm getting baptized is 
baptized because God says to, it's shown that I'm drowning my sins, I'm coming up a new person. That's pretty much the basic. Now, laying on no hands, um, there's, there's not that many Christians who know what that means, the laying on of hands. They've heard it. They say, yeah, it means uh, if someone's sick, you lay your hands on them. That's just basic, basic stuff. In God's eyes, this is basic. The resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment, that's basic stuff. How, you, know, you ask a question, well, how about eternal judgment? When does that begin? I mean, do they know eternal judgment for us, we get when we give our life to the Lord? Right then and there, when we give our life, our heart to the Lord, He has judged us to be right. Right then and there. But the lost people, they're not going to get their judgment until Judgment Day, after the millennium. After he's, he's going to let Satan loose for a little while, and I'm not going to go all through that, but Satan's going to be, after the millennium, Satan will be loose for a little while, and then the judgment. Well, their judgment, lost people, are not going to come until then. So how many, people, I mean, how many Christians can tell you that? Oh, I've been judged already. I'm judged to be right. How many? They don't know, but this is, God said, this is basic. This is milk. He's saying it right here. This is milk. If you don't know that, now you're thinking, man, I really don't know anything. Huh? This makes you think there's a lot of people on milk. There is a lot of Christians on milk. That's why I said there's a lot of Christians out there on the battleground that don't have the power. They're not using the power of God that's in them. In verse 3, and this will we do if God permits. What Paul is saying right here, if God permits me, I will teach you to be, to be mature in the Lord. And you're thinking, well, what do you mean if God permits? Well, yeah, I'll permit you, Paul, to do it if you stay walking with me. What if Paul goes on to another doctrine, to another uh, belief? And God's not, God's not going to allow him, permit him to keep teaching this when he's teaching this over here. So that's all he means there. Paul is saying, if God permits me, and he will, I want to teach Christians to become mature. And that's the same thing that's in my heart. The main reason I like teaching is because I want to see baby Christians grow up to be mature. So, so then, Satan, it's not going to be easy for Satan to attack them. He's still going to try. But as mature Christians, we have more power. We have the power of Jesus that's living in us to go go up against Him. I hate seeing Christians being defeated by the devil. I hate that because I don't like the devil. And when this is a brother or a sister, when I see a brother or a sister who's being defeated, that really gets to me. Now, I wish I could go over there and fight the devil for them. I wish I could do that, but I can't. They got to do it on their own. Believe me, if I could, I would. Verse 4. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gifts and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and have the power of the world to come if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance seeing they crucified themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to open shame. Again, we see that Paul is speaking to Christians. Paul is saying, when you've been a Christian and you fall away, do lost people fall away? Fall, well, lost people are already falling away. They're, they're dead. But right here he says, when you're a Christian, when only a Christian, Christian can fall away. And this is what it's, I'm just showing again. Because the reason I keep pointing that out is they got people who, preachers, teachers who teach these verses, but they teach this for lost people or, or backsliders who've lost their salvation. Not the backsliders I'm talking about. I'm talking about the backsliders that they're talking about as people, Christians who have lost their salvation. They use these scriptures. But I'm showing you right here, God is talking to Christians. And when I said backsliding, I'm talking, you know, I've already explained what that means. When you do fall, like I said, meaning backslide, you don't put Jesus back on the cross again. I've said that before. It hurts my heart. The reason is because we're family. That's my brother, that's my sister. And that's the way I look at him, in the spirit. That's my brother and that's my sister. And I do not want to see them living defeated lives. Not when they have the power of God in them. 
Verse 7. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh off upon it, and bringeth forth herbs, meat for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessings from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. What it says here is that they do not bear any fruit. These Christians do not bear any fruit. That's what the word herbs mean in verse 7. They're not bearing any fruit, showing. Like I said, in the Bible, the Bible says, you're known by their fruits. What it's saying right here, these Christians have no fruit. Some, some religions believe that verse 8 shows they've lost their salvation, like I've said. But there's one word in here they seem to leave out. It says, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. They're close to... They're close to losing their salvation. It says right here, they're, they're nigh, they're near to it. It doesn't say they lost it. The word nigh is very important here. It says they're, these Christians are close to losing it. It doesn't say they lost it. That's why I say every word in the Bible is important to read. In um, 1 Peter 4.18 it says, and if the righteous, now listen, the righteous, which is us, Christians, and if the righteous, if the Christians scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? So what, what it's saying right here is, in Peter is, if we barely make it, those of us who are Christians, then the lost, the, the ungodly, they ain't there. But right here it says, if we, just like up here, they are nigh unto cursing to be burned. They're close to it. They're near to it, but they're not there. Just like here, even though we just barely make it, but we made it. Do you understand what I'm saying? We don't lose it like some religions uh, teach, that you lose your salvation. The only thing I got to say to that is they don't read the scriptures right. And another thing I got to say to that, they're saying God is not big enough, He's not strong enough to keep us. And they don't know English. Like I said, the word save means you made it. And the, word, the King James, which is in the fallible word of God, when it says you're saved, then you're saved. God said that. Amen. Now how can they say you can lose it when God said you're saved? You made it. I hope you all hear what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Verse 9, But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation Though we does speak. Again, I'm saying again, showing that he's speaking to Christians, because he says to them, Beloved. Does God call the lost beloved? The ungodly? Does he call them beloved? No, no this is the Christians. The, the, I mean, we just need to learn how to read. It says beloved. So if he's if he's saying beloved, if he's calling us beloved, then he's calling us then he's talking to Christians. Paul is saying there are more, he's saying there's more to being a Christian than just milk. This is what the this what this is what this whole chapter that I'm reading is about. The the rewards that come with salvation. After you get born again, man, there are rewards out there. When you do God's will, when you're living the way He wants you to live, man, there are gonna be rewards in heaven. He might even reward you now, and he does. But I, I want to wait for my rewards in heaven because that's going to be, to me, rewards in heaven is going to be better than rewards here on earth. To me. I want to be in heaven and get rewards because the rewards in heaven, oh my gosh. Can you imagine what heaven's like? And then there's going to be rewards? <laughs> hey, amen. Verse 10. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love which you have showed toward His name. When we're walking with the Lord, we're showing Him how much we love Him. So it's saying right here, when we're walking with Him, doing His will, we're showing how much we love His name, Him. And that ye have ministered to the saints and to minister. Again, God is not, He's not going to forget the love we show toward Him and to other brothers in the Lord. He's not going to forget about that love, He says. He, he will reward us for that. That's going to be a reward. Verse 11, And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. 
Paul and the others desire that every one of you, every one of us, become as they are. Paul and his disciples, his, the, the ones who followed with him, they walked with the Lord. They were ministering and walking with the Lord. He's saying, my desire is that you be like us. Because if you're like us, then you're like the Lord. Because we're following the Lord. It's like me saying, hey, y'all follow me. Because if y'all follow me, then you have to follow the Lord. Because that's who I'm following. Amen? Amen? He wants us to become mature. He says, that how wonderful it would be if all of y'all were like us. Now, he's not saying all of us should be preachers or teachers. He's not saying that. What he's saying is being like us, meaning follow us like we're following the Lord. We want y'all to follow the Lord the way we are. That's what he's saying. Because not everybody can be a preacher or a teacher. Because in uh, James 3.1, it says, Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers. Now, this is the Living Bible. In the King James the word says masters. Master means preachers or teachers. Right here it just says teachers. But it says, Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become masters in the church. For we who teach will be judged more strictly. Did I hear that? Oh yeah. Did I, did I hear that? You better believe I heard that. And you better believe when I study, I got to know that I know that I know that this is from God. I'm not going to give Jesse's opinion. If I ever do give my opinion, I will tell you, now this is what I think. So that way you can accept it or you don't have to accept it. But I hardly ever do that. I hardly ever give my opinion. But right here it says, who is judged more strictly. And that's why I said the priests in the tabernacle, they were judged more strictly. And it's still today. Preachers and teachers today were very accountable for the way we teach or preach. We're also very accountable the way we live. I've said that before. Drinking is not a sin. Getting drunk is a sin. But if I'm out there having dinner and I drink one beer and somebody sees that, you think, oh, he's just having one beer, it's okay. No. They're not going to think that. They're going to think, look, he teaches the Word of God and look at him, he's over there drinking. Drinking. They don't know I'm just having one beer. So that's why preachers and teachers have to watch themselves a little more than Christians. And I hate to put it that way, but that's what it says here. For we who teach will be judged more strictly. And that's the only reason I say that. Then we can have the full, full assurance of hope of the end when we're closer, when we're mature in the Lord. When we're, when we're apart from the Lord, it's kind of hard to have hope. I mean, how can we have hope if we're not walking with the Lord? kind of hard to do that. When we're walking with the Lord and growing, He tells us down in verse 19, that hope that we have in Jesus, He is the anchor of our soul. If you read further down in James 3, verse 19, He says, the anchor of our soul and is trustworthy. Can we trust the Lord? If we can't trust the Lord, then we're wasting our time being Christians. If you cannot believe everything in the Word of God, you're wasting your time saying, I'm a Christian. Because to be a Christian, we got to do what Amos 3.3 3 says. It says, how can you walk if you're not in agreement? So how can we walk with the Lord if we're not in agreement with Him? If we don't, if we're like, oh, well, this verse, I don't think that's really, no, no. We can't say that. The Word of God, the, the, the King James is the inspired Word of God. We have to believe that every word, every word in the Bible, the King James, is from the Lord. So are there any wasted words in here? Any wasted scriptures? So can we say, well, I'm not sure about that one. I don't know if that's true. No, we can't say that. Because if we're saying that, then we're saying, oh, I think God's lying. Do you hear me? And believe it or not, you have people who do that. Well, I don't like that verse. And they don't they don't obey it. Verse twelve that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Believe believe what you have just heard. Believe everything you just heard, and you will not become a backslider. If you listen to what these verses I just read, you are not gonna want to be a backslider. 
you're going to want to grow. And it says, any of you who want to be like us, you will inherit the Lord's promises by faith and by his patience. You know, it's like, Lord, come. This world's so wicked, you need to come. But they have patience. Because God knows how many more people are going to get saved. Believe me or not, as long as the Lord can see there's people who are going to give their life to Him, He's going to give them a chance. When the Lord comes, now this is what I believe, okay, this is one time I'm going to say this. I just told you I don't, but this is one time I'm going to do it. <laughs> I think when the world gets to where no one else is going to follow Him, that the rest of the world, is, that the whole world is just in rejection, no, no more are going to get saved, I believe that's when God's going to come. That's when Jesus will come. That's what I believe. And I can be totally wrong, but that's what I believe. Because everyone, when I was lost, the way I lived, man, I should have been dead a long time ago. I'm talking about a long time ago. But I believe God saw that I was going to give my heart to Him. And that's why He kept me alive. He kept me alive. Knowing this. Because God knows everything. He's already seen the beginning to the end. He's, he's already seen it. That's why He can write it down in the book. He's already saw it. We're just living it out now. But He's already seen everything. And He saw that Jesse was later on in life, after being an idiot, was going to give his life to the Lord. He saw that in me. And I really truly believe that's why I made it through all those times that sh drugs, Drugs should have killed me a long time ago. The knife that was put up to my throat, that should have killed me. The gun that was pulled on me, that should have killed me. But who kept me alive? The Lord kept me alive. Amen. Cleansing is walking with the Lord. Having fellowship with the Lord. That's why I did, when I said I was going to, when I get on the, the, uh, the basin where, the, where they would cleanse the priest, that's why I said, this is going to take me a little while to teach on, because I want to show you how important it is to be cleansed, to walk with the Lord. Cleansing is making yourself pure with the Lord. And when you're that way, you can walk with Him. can't walk with Him if you're not cleansed. So we need to be cleansed. 1 John, verses 1 through 9. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. Of course, we know he's speaking about Jesus here. Jesus was manifested unto us. Verse 3 That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father. We need to have fellowship with our God. Um, that's why I'm, um, like I said before, you can be a born again Christian and have no fellowship with God. You're born again, you've accepted Him, but that's all you did. You got into the door, the door of salvation, you got into the door, but that's it. Now you're just standing at the door. You're not going further into the Christianity, what Christianity, what the Lord has to offer us. You're standing, you got saved, you're at the door, but that's it. Man, the door must be crowded. It is crowded. Like I said, this speak this this chapter is speaking about Christians having fellowship with the Lord. Another reason I'm I know he's speaking to Christians because in chapter two, which I'm not going to get there, but in chapter two, he says, "My little children." Now, who's he call his children? Christians. Christians. So that's we're talking about Christians right here, because in chapter two he says, "My little continuing." But he says, my little children. So these are for Christians. We're talking about Christians here. Verse 4. And these things we write unto you, that your joy may be full. We need fellowship with the Lord if we want to have a joyful and full life. Joyful, full life. Now you can have a full life, but it's not going to be joyful without the Lord. When, jo when Jody and I, if we have an argument, do you think we're full of joy? I don't think so. Until one of us, which usually it's me, but until one of us says I'm sorry and we, re we repent, whatever started the argument, until then, we're not full of joy. But once one of us repents and asks for forgiveness, what happens? 
we come back together. And when we get back together, now we're full of joy again. When Jody and I are not arguing, hey, I'm full of joy. I love my wife. But to keep it that way, I got I to gotta make sure it stays that way. Especially since I'm the head of the house. God said, hey, I, whether you're right or wrong, Jesse, you need to make it right. I don't care if you were right. If she thinks she was right, but she isn't, and you're right, and even though I see that you're right, but you're the head of the house. So you go make things right. If you need to say, I'm sorry, and it's not your fault, then you need to do it anyway. If you want to make things right in the house. Y'all hear me? Just like kids. And children. You think your children are full of joy when you've disciplined them? No, they're not full of joy. You don't have fellowship with your kids at that time. But with kids, you know, just a little while, maybe, maybe a day, maybe. They forget all about it and they're back, you know, back wanting to have fun with you. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Got to have fellowship. Got to have fellowship. That's what, fellowship with the Lord, if you want to have joy and fulfilled life, fellowship with the Lord. And the way to have fellowship is what? By being cleansed. You need to be cleansed to have that fellowship with the Lord. As that the same thing goes with our Father. When we're separated from Him, when we're in sin and we're separated from the Lord, are we full of joy? We shouldn't be. If we are, again, something's wrong. If I'm separated from the Father, I am not going to be full of joy. That's me. Now, I believe that should be all Christians. All Christians should feel the same way. If you're separated from your Father, you should not be full of joy. Verse 5. This then is the message we have heard of Him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him, we walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. You know, only you and God. I can't tell you. I, can't, I don't know your heart. You don't know my heart. He knows your heart. He knows our heart better than we know our heart. So we, if we say we have fellowship with Him and we don't, we're liars. But like I said, I don't know. I can't, you know, people can fool me or I can fool you. Y'all don't know my heart. But we can see their fruits. The fruits is what helps us know if a person is a born-again Christian or not and if they're walking with the Lord by their fruits. And I've been saying this for a long time. I'm going to teach about the fruits of the Spirit and all and stuff like that, but I just well God has gave it to me because I teach what God gives me, and apparently this is this is what He wants me to teach. Verse seven. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. There's that word cleanses. What does the basin do in the tabernacle? It cleanses the priest, just like us today. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, cleanses us from all sin. Again, there is the word all. When we break fellowship with the Lord, which is sin, we don't go back to the altar where the blood was shed. Like I said, we don't go back to the cross. It says all sin has already been paid for. Past, present, and future. It's already been paid for at the altar. Okay? When it says all sin... You believe that? Not everybody believes that. And the reason is suicide. People believe, there's a lot of people who believe if you commit suicide, God is not going to forgive you. Matthew 12.31 Now listen to it. Wherefore I say unto you, all. That's what I say. When we read the Bible, make sure you're, you, you, you got every word that you say. You got it and you hear it in your heart. All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. Now there's two kinds of blasphemy. There are the ungodly thoughts and actions that we do. Now that's, the Bible says that's blasphemy. I'll show you in a minute. That's the kind we do, but we can be forgiven for that. But then the next one is blasphemy is rejecting the Lord. Now that's the, that's the one that's unforgivable. He cannot forgive that one. He can 
if I'm if, if I'm a lost person right now and I'm saying I don't want him, I don't have anything to do with him, well he can't forgive that. But if I got people praying, Jesse, we're praying for you that you get saved, and I do get saved, well then now he can forgive me for that blessing, for rejecting him. So even then he can forgive you, but while you're in it and you don't repent of it, he can't forgive with that one. Remission. They don't take they don't have that remission of sin. They don't have it. They have not been made alive again. So as long as they're in unbelief, as long as they're in rejection of the Lord, God says, I can't forgive that. Now, if you are a believer and you do sins, I can forgive sins. He said, I can forgive all sin. All sin. 1 Timothy 1.13 Who was before a this is who was before a blasphemer and a prosecutor and injurious, meaning unwise, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. So he was a blasphemer. It says it right here. He was a prosecutor. He was unwise. But when he when he received mercy from the Lord and he accepted it. He says, hey, when I did all that, I did it in ignorance. I didn't know what I was doing. That's what I'm saying right here. So he, it's mean he was doing it that way. Now God's saying, okay, now I can save you because now your eyes are open. So it can happen. A blasphemer can be forgiven. Saying it right here. He plainly says, who was before a blasphemer? But now he's obtained mercy. What's mercy? Salvation. If you receive the mercy God has to give you, you got salvation. In the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, now I wish we still lived in the Old Testament times. Ooh, we wouldn't have too many people here. <laughs> in the Old Testament, they would stone those who did blaspheme. Levit Leviticus 24, 16. And he that blasphemeth the name of the Lord, he shall surely be put to death. Just think if we were still living in the Old Testament time. But wouldn't that be considered a sin because you're killing somebody? Well, who's going to kill him? Christian, not going to kill him. He that blasphemes in the name of the Lord, he shall surely put to death. Does that mean we're going to kill him? No. How many times do we see in the Bible where God killed them? Killed people? Now, he might use us. He might. But it doesn't matter who he uses. God says they will be put to death. Just like rape. Rape in the Bible, in the Old Testament. If a man raped a woman, he was put to death. If we still live by God's laws, we wouldn't need so many prisons out there. Right. Men wouldn't be raping women. Oh, I'm, if I rape her, I'm, uh -uh. I'm not going to rape her. Oh, they'll kill me. But we don't do nothing. And if we do something, it's a long time before they get judged for it. And when they do get judged and sent to prison, they got a roof over their head, they're fed, they have a bed. Hey, prison ain't that bad. You might be stuck in one place, but hey, you don't need to work. Now they got TV, you know? They got TV, yeah. <laughs> I mean, prison's not bad. If they don't want to work, they don't have to work. They can't make them work. When they go to the, to the cell and say, let's go work, whether it be cutting grass or whatever, if they don't want to go, all they got to do is I don't want to go. And they don't go. But most of them go because they want to go outside. They get tired of being in their cell. But they don't have to go. So why, hey, uh, if I get caught raping this girl, hey, I got room and board. Yeah. I don't even have to work. I got room and board for free. That's, that's the way the world here in this country. Now in other countries, oh, they're a lot more stricter than we are. This country, America, this country, our sin, I mean our sin, our, our justice system stinks. That's why we have people going to jail and they're having to let them out because there's not enough room to put everybody in jail, yeah. in prison. And they got a lot of prisons. But so many people are committing criminal acts because prison doesn't scare them. Yeah. But let, let us live this way. Let us live this way. Rape. Lord says, you rape a woman your life is going to be taken. And there's others. Verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Believe it or not, there's a religion out there who believe 
They have no sin. I'm serious. Because if they do have sin, they lose their salvation. There's religion out there that believe you can lose your salvation. How do you lose it? By sinning. So that means you have to go sinless. Yeah. Right? So those religions that believe you can lose your salvation, what they're saying is, you commit one sin, that's it. That's not what God tells us. He says, I'm going to forgive you when you do sin because He knows we're going to sin. He says, I'm going to forgive you, forget it. Amen? Amen? That's the kind of God we live for. Those are the words we hear in the Bible. That's true. Verse 9, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Confession. If we confess our sins. Now, I've taught you many times, the Bible shows that confession and repentance goes together. If you confess but you don't repent, what did you do? All you did was, yeah, I did that, but I'm going to still do it. Because you're not repenting of it. It's kind of like a religion, again, that's out there. All they have to do on Saturday or Sunday, go confess it. Same with so many prayers. A man tells them, okay, go say these many prayers and you can be forgiven. Is that in the Bible? No. I haven't read it. That a man can tell you how to be forgiven by him telling you, well, do this, 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 and you'll be forgiven. That's not what the Bible says. Proverbs 28, 13. He that covereth his sin shall not prosper. You want to live a sinful life? You want to live away from the Lord? You're not going to have a prosperous life. And when I say, you got a lot of sinners out there who are living a very good life. They live in mansions. They have very good life. But is that life? No. It's dead people living that way. They're dead. They're living in a good dead life, but they're dead. But right here the Lord says, He that covers shall not prosper. When you try to cover your sin, you're not going to prosper. Meaning, you're not going to go to be with the Lord. You're not going to go to heaven. And heaven is tremendously a zillion, billion, whatever number you want to put, better than where we're at. So what we've learned here is cleansing. How important it is to be cleansed. So that way when you are cleansed, just like the priest, you can do God's ministries. And when you're, doing, when you're cleansed, and you're, it just automatically you're in fellowship with the Lord. Now the fellowship I just showed here, how many of us would want that? How many of us wants to have that fellowship with God? I know I do. That's where I want. That's where I want to be. To have fellowship with my father. I love my father. I want to see. Well, I can't see him now. But I know him by his words. I don't have to see him to know him. I already know him by just reading his Bible. Reading the words. I know he's a gracious, beautiful, loving father. But, but also he's very just. Amen.